It's now official. Tourists are banned from geisha districts of Gion and Kyoto. The rumor had been floating around in various Japanese articles lately, but it's now being made official. Tourists would no longer be allowed to roam the streets of Gion. The drastic measure comes after several incidents were reported of tourists behaving very inappropriately with the geishas. The city had already put a measure in place forbidding photography of the geishas under penalty of a fine. However, they have now decided to take it one step further. Japan has been faced with over-tourism, and one area that was particularly struggling were the streets of Gion. Gion is a place of work for geishas, but also a place of residence for many locals. Many tourists have been treating the area like a theme park, stalking Maikos, apprentice geishas, outside tea houses for photos. Maikos are often 16 or 17 years old, making it particularly frightening to them. Worse than this though, there's been alarming reports of assaults. Some tourists have been throwing cigarette buds into geisha's necks. One geisha had her kimono torn off by a tourist. A tourist even threw $10,000 at a geisha with his hotel room key. Geishas were reporting feeling unsafe, which has now prompted the Japanese government to take action. New signs are being put in place by the government announcing the ban in the areas concerned. A fine of 10,000 yen or around $65 will apply to everyone who violates this rule. The measure will go into place from April, just as Japan is entering its busiest travel season of the year, cherry blossom season. The streets concerned are shown in the map on the screen. The streets affected are the main geisha streets that are very narrow and that get overcrowded very easily. Fortunately, the shopping street of Shijo and the tourist beloved street of Hananikoji are spared from the law. There will be other posters explaining laws tourists need to abide by when visiting Kyoto. It has been announced that clients who have booked a tour with a travel agency or a tour operator will be allowed to visit these streets as a special exemption. As a travel agent and a content creator, I feel like this is something very important for me to talk about. If you travel to Japan, you have to understand how to behave properly to respect local customs. I watched Sydney Watson's video recently about influencers bothering people for clicks, and I feel like in Japan, influencers are harassing geishas to gain notoriety online. It's very sad that as a consequence, all tourists will now be banned from the geisha historic district of Gion, which is hundreds of years old. More than that though, I feel like there's a big misunderstanding in the West about what a geisha actually is. In this video, I want to go over the history of geisha and how they became such iconic symbols of Japanese culture. If you find this video insightful, please don't forget to subscribe. We're nearing 300 subscribers right now. My goal is to get to 500 so I can keep making videos for you guys and make even more amazing videos for you. When you think of Japanese culture, you think of uh, cherry blossoms, Mount Fuji, and the geisha. Upon traveling to Japan, there are things that my clients expect to see, and those are the three. The image of the geisha brings up a fantasy of exoticism to many travelers. Curious to catch a glimpse of them, we organized tours of Gion, the geisha districts, for them. However, the image of the geisha in the West is distorted by media and Hollywood movies and not a lot of people understand what they actually are. I want this video to help clarify this. The geisha as a profession was born during the Edo period, Japan's pre-modern prosperous period brought on by the rule of the Tokugawa shogunate. The geisha profession fell under the wider umbrella of what was referred to as yujo, which I would translate as entertainer. Under this umbrella also featured the oiran, who were high-class prostitutes, the oiram prostitutes were influential on all levels of society. They were the objects of prints, literature, shunga, erotic art, haiku or poems, and theater. Their clients included powerful lords and samurai, but they had the power to refuse any client they wanted, making them one of the most powerful women of their era. The geisha worked hand in hand with them, but were at the bottom of society's social scale. Japan was divided into a caste system. At the top were samurai, then merchants, then at the bottom were bunakumin, untouchables, or outcasts. 
geishas were artists who worked in the pleasure district of Yoshiwara in Edo, now called Asakusa in Tokyo. Geishas could either be men or women, so it wasn't gender specific. Their sole job was to entertain the Oiran's customers by playing music or dancing while the customer waited for days, sometimes weeks, for the Oiran to free up for an appointment. Both the geisha and the Oiran, although the latter was a prostitute, were perceived as artists by Edo society. Both the geisha and the Oiran were initiators of fashion in Edo society, where they were perceived as society's artistic ideal. However, this paradigm started to shift in the 19th century. The 19th century became a century of decadence for the Oiran, who began to wear gaudy makeup and attires and fell prey to tuberculosis and venereal diseases. The Oiran started falling out of fashion, leaving room for the geisha to flourish. The geisha started taking their place and became the one patronized by intellectuals, politicians and other high-ranking intellectuals. The end of the 19th century brought the end of the Edo period and the rule of the Tokugawas. The new era was named Meiji, or Era of Enlightenment. When Japan reopened to the world after two centuries of feudalism, it was faced with the task of imposing itself as a modern nation-state. The fear of being colonized by big Western powers, who had already colonized most of Asia, was very real. As a symbol of its power as a nation, Japan needed to promote a sense of unified cultural identity to the rest of the world. Japan, having been divided into caste systems for 200 years, with very little interaction between each caste, was tasked with unifying the people under one identity. For a viable nation-state requires national subjects in possession of a sense of nation, a collective knowledge that everyone can identify and relate to. The Japanese authorities of the new era decided to go back in time to retrieve elements that they thought the world required to construct a sense of Japanese cultural identity. The pleasure districts have been a precursor of popular culture for the past 200 years, became a major source of art form to promote Japanese cultural identity. Since it was a disgrace to frequent the pleasure quarter for a man of the samurai class during the Edo period, they would come dressed as commoners of men of lower class to visit those oirans. So if you think about it, the pleasure districts of Ishiwara were the only place in feudal Japan where all citizens appeared equal. This reached the point where oiran, geishas, clients and patrons had developed their own customs, traditions and language. The leaders of the new Meiji era came to realize that they could take the art forms that had emerged from these quarters to construct a unified Japanese identity. Yet, the Japanese government knew that the Christian West would struggle to accept the taint of licensed prostitution on these art forms. The popularity of the Oiran and the Geisha stemmed from an erotic ideal, after all. The West also accused Japan of licensing slavery in the pleasure quarters. The Meiji government, conscious of Western opinion, decided to enact laws to modify these art forms in order to be taken seriously by Western powers. The survival of Japan as a nation-state depended on it. If Japan was to become civilized, in Victorian terms of course, the licensed prostitutes or Oiran's influence on society could no longer be allowed to flourish. Japan held the first Kyoto exhibition in 1872, which attracted a large number of foreign visitors, which until then had not been allowed to enter Kyoto. To showcase Japanese national identity, geishas were put on the forefront. They offered a much safer option than the Oiran, because they had never officially been licensed as prostitutes. As I explained earlier, the sole purpose was to entertain the Oiran's customer with dance and music. The first ever performance of Miyako Odori was organized at the Kyoto exhibition. Having received very positive comments from the foreign visitors of the time, who particularly enjoyed the exotic dances, the Miyako Odori became the dance shown to foreign tourists ever since. Today, the Miyako Odori show is performed every year in April to tourists in the Geisha district of Kyoto, the district that the Japanese authorities are planning to ban tourists from. So, of course, this is very sad. After the Kyoto exhibition, the Geisha became internationally renowned entertainers and stars. With their kimonos costumes, white makeups, solitary dances, and exotic instruments and dances, they represented an art form completely different from Western aesthetics. 
the foreign eyes, they became national Japanese icons and the ideal of Japanese femininity. Consequently, in 1872, the Japanese government announced a proclamation for the emancipation of geishas and prostitutes. To operate as a geisha or a prostitute, you needed a license for either profession or both. Some geishas were only geishas, while others possessed a license for both being a geisha and a prostitute. To be modern at the time meant to be Western, and to be Western was trendy. So consequently, geishas started to adopt Western customs, Western clothes and fashion. They became so popular that many government officials in Japan at the time took them as wives. As time passed and nationalism grew in the years leading to the Second World War in the Showa era, things changed. When geishas started cutting their hair and perming them, they weren't quite Japanese anymore to the people of the time. Similarly, the more modern Japan became and the less Japanese it was. People started yearning for the pre-modern period, the last true period of Japanese spirit. Geishas became the image of an idealized past, of the real Japan, that the country needed to recover. After the war, under immense pressure from the occupying American forces, the Yoshiwara Pleasure District closed down. Despite protests from local officials, a law was passed in 1956 declaring all forms of prostitution illegal, ending for good 300 years of Oiran tradition, but also seeing the geisha's fate as an entertainer and not a prostitute. Most recently, as Japan is at the forefront of modernity, geishas have become a curator of tradition. As the profession is no longer appealing to younger generations who prefer prestigious degrees and professions, geishas are slowly disappearing. Prior to World War II, there were an estimated 80,000 geishas in Kyoto. Today, there are less than 300. In 2007, Japanese government began actively promoting the profession through tourism. Geisha dances are no longer performed solely for their elite clients, but are now widely available to tourists. To the tourists catching a glimpse of a geisha in the streets of Kion, I want to tell you, please consider yourself lucky. You are catching a glimpse of an art form hundreds of years old that has evolved drastically through the ages for various political reasons. Geishas are women who make conscious choice of not pursuing a modern career to maintain the spirit of Japanese identity and history and culture alive. So when you see them in the streets of Kyoto, please be respectful and don't throw things at them, pull their skirts or force them to take photos with you. I hope this video was helpful and that it gave you some insights into the world of the geishas. Please don't forget to like, comment and share this video. This tells the YouTube algorithm to suggest my video to more people so I can reach more people like you. Please don't forget to ring that notification bell to be notified of whenever I drop a video. In the next video, I'll be taking you on a tour of the old town of Paris, showing you the oldest bakery in Paris, which was the bakery that served Louis XV. So yes, it's that old. So this is something for you to look forward to. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video. On a side note, look at this really cool mug that I found recently. It's got Paris all over it. I found this in the Starbucks. And it's got the Eiffel Tower on it here. And then you've got the Arc de Triomphe, all the famous monuments of Paris. It's really cool.